Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today's topic is about finding military records and then some quick ways to honor our veteran ancestors and relatives. Here in the United States, we'll be celebrating Veterans Day this coming Monday, and it's a good time to honor your veteran ancestors. And as we head into the holiday season, it's also a good time to um, talk to family members to get some of those stories, to talk to living family members about their military service, and above all, to be sure and thank them for that service. So with that introduction, let's dive into today's presentation. One of the first things you're going to need to do when you are trying to determine who your military ancestors are is to be aware of the military conflicts and who was eligible to serve. So I've created a little chart here that just, can sh that just shows you um, what the major military conflicts in the United States have been and the eligibility or the year ranges for the birth of those who may have served in that conflict. Now. I did this, this is kind of rough ages, right? Um, I, I, the age ranges were 17 to 55. So any man who is between the ages of 17 and 55 is considered eligible for service in that particular conflict or war. And um, one of the things to keep in mind is that some men lied <laughs> to be able to serve. And so they could have been a little bit younger or in some cases even a little bit older depending on the circumstances. So um, one of the things that you can do is, once you look at this, you can say, for example, if I'm looking for my Civil War ancestors, I know that the Civil War was between 1861 and 1865, therefore men who were born roughly between 1806 and 1848 would be eligible to serve in that particular war. So I can go into my Family Tree Maker database and I can pull up this filter option and I can say I want to filter in um, all males, let's start there. So anybody who is a male, I'm going to filter them in. And it's going to take a minute because my database is a little bit large, but, but it'll create this list for me then of all men in my database. And then what I'm going to want to do is filter out anybody who is not in the specific age range that I am looking for. So if I come back over here to my handy little my handy little chart, let's try that again. Uh, my handy little chart, I'm going to filter out anybody who was born before 1806 and anybody who was born after 1848. So filter out anybody where the birth year is before 1806. And that's one operator. So I get rid of anybody born before 1806. And then when that's done, I will filter out anybody who was born after 1848. And now what I've done, I still, out, there is a kind of a, um, a little odd thing in Family Tree Maker because it doesn't allow me to filter out anybody where there is no birth date. So there's a couple of things I could have done to get rid of those. But what I end up with is this list of men here then. <clears throat> Let's click OK. So I can just skim down this list really quickly, and now I have these lists, this list of men who were born in the appropriate age range, and I can just go through them one at a time. I can always see my relationship to them to determine if I'm interested enough <laughs> in looking into their service, and of course I probably will be. Most everybody in my database is um, either a direct, like an ancestor or a cousin in some, to some degree. And so I can just then go through these men one at a time and look for military service records for them. So that's how, that, that's how I use my database to determine who's eligible to serve so that I even know what I'm looking for. Now, once you've created that list or you have an idea of who it is um, that you're looking for military service information about, then you need to know what records even exist. Now, one of the things that I just need to make sure that you understand is that um, there was a very large fire in the 1970s in St. Louis at the archives there. And so most, um, they estimate about 80% of the military service records for men who served in World War I and World War II were destroyed in that fire. 
So if you're looking for World War I or World War II service records, the best place to start is at home or with family. I happen to have um, a grandfather who served in World War I and then two grand, well, a great grandfather who served in World War I and then two grandfathers who served in World War II. And we've been able to collect their service records just from private um, things that were in their files and that were passed down to um, my, passed to my grandmothers and have since come into my possession. So, so World War I and World War II, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. But for other wars, for all those other conflicts and for other opportunities, um, you need to know what records exist. And so I would recommend that you go to the Ancestry.com wiki. If you're not familiar with that, you're going to find it here under the Learning Center. So if you just hover over the Learning Center and then scroll down to this Family History wiki, it's the very bottom option here. One of the things we've done is we have put the source, which is the guidebook to American genealogy, we've put that online and it's available for free. And basically what the source does is it lists all different record types and what exists and where you can find it. We've also got little quick links up here in the top, so I could click on military records and now you'll see what it does is um, I have an overview of military records here. And then if I know, for example, that my family was specifically from Missouri, I could maybe click on that and read about that as well. And then what it does is it just provides you with details about um, what records are going to exist, what wars and conflicts there were. All of this is um, information that I put on that chart, right? So you don't have to copy that. You can just come right here to the wiki and see this information. Um, and then in, under each section or under each section about the war, it tells you what kinds of records were created um, during those particular conflicts, just to get you familiar with the records and the record availability. And then it tells you who holds those particular records or where you're going to be able to find many of them. So that's the overview of military records. And then, like I said, the... Um, then, then it breaks it down by state. So you can actually come in and you can see what, where records are at a state level, what records exist that way. So that again is the Family History Wiki, and you're gonna find that in the Learning Center if you scroll down to the very bottom option under Family History Wiki, and then click on Military Records to figure out what even exists. Once you've determined what exists, now you need to know where you can find it. So um, the first place you're going to look, as always, I hope, <laughs> is the card catalog on Ancestry.com. If you're new to um, our live stream broadcasts or if you're not familiar with the card catalog, you're going to find it under the search button. You just hover over search, you'll get this little drop down menu and the card catalog is the very bottom thing there. That card catalog shows you all of the databases all 31,288 databases available on Ancestry.com. You can then filter by a couple of things. You can filter by collection, you can filter by location, and you can filter by date, either century or decade. So I'm gonna click on military to filter down to just military records. You'll notice here we have 1,121 databases that contain military records from all over the world. Now, if I want to look just specifically at U.S. military records, I would click on that. If you wanted to look at British military records or German military records, of course, you could filter down to those as well. And, and now what it lists is all 1,009 databases. If you look over here, it also then breaks it down by the types of record. So let's just talk about these really briefly. The first category of record is draft, enlistment, and service. Most of you are probably pretty familiar with the World War I draft cards. Now I get asked this question a lot and so I'm just going to answer it and, and hope that it makes sense to all of you. All men who were eligible, who were of age um, during World War I had to register for the draft. Just because they registered for the draft does not mean that they actually served in the military. So you should be able to find any ancestor or relative of yours that was living, that was male, and that was of age during World War I should be included in this particular database. As a matter of fact, I think in the database description down here, um, it says approximately 98% of the men under the age of 46 
are represented in this collection. So chances are, if your ancestor was living in the United States during that time and was a male of age, they should be in this particular record collection. But just because you find a draft card for them does not mean they served. All it was was a, um, it was, it was a draft registration so that they were eligible to serve or to be drafted. So use those. We've got World War I draft cards. We also have World War II draft cards. However, we only have the fourth registration or what is known as the old man's draft. And that's because of privacy reasons. Um, it's for... Um, the fourth registration was for men who were born uh, between 1877 and 1897, so they would have been 45 to 64 years old at the time, and that means because they were born so long ago that they're likely deceased now. So the first three rounds of the draft for World War II are not available online because of privacy, because many of the, well, some of those men are still living. So those are the draft cards. That's the first category of military record you're going to find. The next category of military record you're going to find are going to be enlistment records. Now you'll see here we have the U.S. World War II Army enlistment records, and there are over 8 million of them. So again, if you know that your ancestor served um, in, the, in World War II, this will be their enlistment record. Now... It's for men who enlisted, it's not for those who were drafted or for those who had been in service before, already in the military before 1938. So you want to keep that in mind. So here is my grandfather's World War II Army enlistment record. You can see I've already got it attached to my tree here. It gives his birth year, where he's living, his enlistment date, where he enlisted, in this case he enlisted um, at Fort MacArthur in San, Pedro, in San Pedro in Los Angeles County. It lists what he enlisted as. He enlisted as a private, the length of his enlistment when he first signed up, how much education he had, whether or not or his occupation, his marital status, his height, and his weight. Now, my grandfather was about six feet tall. He did not weigh 400 pounds, so I'm not sure um, where that misinformation came from. So, again, this, let's see, this particular database was provided to us um, as an electronic file from the National Archives. So we did not create this index. It came to us this way. Um, and so if you find inaccurate information, unfortunately, you cannot correct that because there's no image. I could, however, leave a comment on that record to state that the information was accurate or inaccurate, whatever. But that's what the Army enlistment records give you is um, a, quite a bit of information about your particular ancestor who enlisted. Now, um, there are other types of um, enlistment and service records available. And if you just click on that link over here for the collection, it filters down to the types of records. We have a Civil War draft. Um, we have muster rolls for the Marine Corps. We have Navy muster rolls. I mean, they're just a lot, depending on what branch of the service your ancestor served in and what military conflict you're interested in, there's just all sorts of records available. These Confederate soldiers compiled service records are excellent records, and I just want to spend just a minute pointing these out. Anytime you come across a record collection that you're interested in, hopefully you've learned this, and if not, then now's a good time. Always scroll down past that search box and read this database description. What you'll discover is that most of our military records come from the National Archives, and then there's details in this database description about exactly what you're going to find in this collection, what these records tell you, and what you can do next with the information that you're provided. So all different conflicts, all different types of um, draft, enlistment, and service records. The next kind of record type under military records is casualties. So if you have an ancestor or a relative that um, was killed in war or died because of wounds sustained in war or, or while in service, they're likely to be on one of those casualty lists or burial records, military burial records. Um, there's also soldier, veteran, and prisoner roles and lists. So just lists of soldiers that were serving in particular conflicts, um, prisoners of war, all of that. Now, my favorite type of military record are pension records. These are so amazing because they're so full of detail. Some of what we have, in, like in the case of the Civil War records, are just an index to the files. Sometimes these files themselves are um, pages and pages and pages long. 
those of you who know Juliana Smith, just a couple weeks ago, she found a pension file for one of her ancestors, and I think she told me it was 124 pages long. And so, so we provide you with this index to then go and find the actual file, either at the National Archives or in some cases, it's going to be on Fold 3. Now let's just talk about Fold 3 briefly. Um, Fold 3 used to be known as Footnote.com. It's a company that Ancestry.com purchased um, a while ago, and it's kind of a niche website. So we're not merging their data with ours. Um, we're, it is a still a separate subscription. There are a lot of people who are interested in military history who are not interested in family history, and Fold 3 allows us to maintain that experience for them. Uh, if you do have a subscription at Ancestry.com, you can get 50% off a subscription to Fold 3. And so it's certainly worth checking out. Look for that ad on our homepage or call um, our um, member services to see if you can get that discount to that subscription. But Fold 3, and the easiest way to find that is just to go to fold3.com, is um, where you're going to find a lot of those pension files themselves. So the index is available on Ancestry.com because we've had it, in this case we've had this database since 2000, but the actual records or the files have been digitized by Fold3, many cases um, before they became part of Ancestry.com um, as a larger company. They've also got Revolutionary War pension files, um, they're working, I think, on War of 1812. Just lots of really great, great military records here on Fold 3. So if you don't find it here, or if all you find here is an index, <clears throat> always go to Fold 3 and check to see what they have available as well. Let me just finish up here by just giving you a further note about pension files. Um, you'll notice here we have, oftentimes they're broken down by state. So if you don't see it um, in a larger database, maybe either filter by state or just kind of look through the list for your particular state, you can see that um, the different states administered the pension. Also, keep in mind that your uh, ancestor may have been deceased and it may be the widow or the guardian of the children that is applying for his military pension. So don't just search under his name or if you search under his name and don't find anything, um, be sure to search his wife's name and his children's names as well as you search through those particular pension files. It becomes a really rich source of information with affidavits about marriage and birth and um, parentage and service and when they served and where they served and who they served with. Lots of really, really great details. Okay, that is all about where you, what, what exists and where you can find it and what some of the tools are available to find it. And then just as kind of a final note, um, we have this really neat tool on Ancestry.com that I have come to just love little things like this. Uh, when you want to um, share or honor a particular ancestor, we've given you the ability within your Ancestry.com tree to create a military page for that person that then becomes an online memorial for them. So this is my great grandfather. He was actually a career military man. He served um, in the Mexican War. He, he was in the infantry that, that chased after Pancho Villa. He served in World War I um, in Europe. And then he became an army recruiter and ran the recruiting station in Los Angeles before he retired. And so he was a military, lifelong career military man. I have actually not just pictures of him in uniform and at his desk in his office in LA. Um, I have photos from his military service overseas. I have letters he wrote while he was serving in, in Mexico. I also have his discharge papers. And you can see I've uploaded one of those images here and I'm in the process of uploading the rest. And so once I get that done, there's this tiny little link over here, and you might have to make your screen bigger to see it, but it says more options. And then there is an option here to create a military page. And what it does is it actually allows you to um, create this, like I said, online memorial. It becomes public. So if your tree is private, your tree stays private, 
but this particular page becomes a public military memorial to this particular person. He's deceased, and so that's perfectly acceptable for me. Um, I could add a photo of him. I could add information, write a story. I could write up my own, in my own words, information that I had discovered or learned about his particular military service. There's the option to add additional photos. I could add audio. So for example, if um, there were people he had served with that were still living or um, family members who he had told stories to, I could interview them and attach those memories as an audio file to this particular image as well. I also have the ability over here, it imports his information about birth and death. I could add his time of service. So when he enlisted to when he was discharged or mustered out, um, I could list his affiliation, what branch of the service he served in, what rank he achieved, the units he served with. And that becomes really important because as we get more of these military pages created, one of the cool things that starts to happen is we start to see others who served in the same unit. And while you may not have information about your ancestors specifically, maybe one of maybe somebody else does. So for example, I have an entire photo, one of those big panoramic photos of the one of the units that my great grandfather served with. And I could attach that, list the unit, and then um, all of a sudden we've got this image or this picture available for anybody who served in that particular unit and they might be able to find an ancestor in that photo that they wouldn't find any other way. If he had specialties, um, if he was still serving, um, I could list his current status, what wars and battles he served in, and then what honors and, re and awards that he received for his service. So all of that becomes this military memorial page that then is again public and others can find it and um, connect with, with others who served in the same units. This becomes, I think, a really, really rich and a really valuable way to, to share. And then I can share this link with, you know, I could copy this URL to Facebook and share it with my cousins and give them an opportunity to see it and to know about his service. And um, it's just a really great way to honor him in that way. So I hope you'll take a look at that and see what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Uh, I have several of those that I, have, um, I plan on creating uh, over the weekend so that they're available for, available for Veterans Day on Monday. And then I'll be sharing those with my family, um, you know, a couple, maybe two or three of them on Monday with my family through Facebook and via email so that they can see those and remember and honor those in our family who served in the, in the U.S. military in particular and fought for our freedoms. Um, that is all I have for you today. Hopefully this was helpful. If you're watching this live and you have specific questions, you can catch me on chat in just a few minutes. If you are watching an archived version of this, feel, feel free to leave a comment on our YouTube channel. Uh, we do monitor those and we'll answer as appropriate. If you have topics or ideas or suggestions for future live stream broadcasts, please feel free to email me at ask at ancestry.com with those research questions and challenges. And then check our Facebook page, click on that events tab to see the schedule for upcoming uh, live stream presentations and the dates and topics. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.